Today, we're going to talk about how to create a series of setups and payoffs to help pull your reader along through your mystery novel and keep them invested at every step along the way. Specifically, we're going to talk about how to use clues to create these setups and payoffs. We'll talk about why it has such an impact on the reader, and we'll discuss four very simple, very practical ways you can make it happen in your novel. Hi, I'm Jane Kalmus, and when I was first drafting this video, I was going to call it Break This Clue In Two, because that is that is largely what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be talking about how to take a single clue that you intend to use in your novel and break it up into two or more separate pieces of information. So to start talking about this, we are going to take a look at the old clue spreadsheet, which I've mentioned a few times on my channel. It's what I use for planning books, and it's a dead simple uh, spreadsheet in that it only has two columns, one for the clue, that is the thing that our sleuth observes, and one for the information she's going to learn from observing that thing. Frequently, when I'm using this spreadsheet, I start by filling out all the information I want my sleuth to learn, and then I come up with a clue, a physical object, an emotional reaction, maybe a suspect stray comment, something that can provide each little drop of intel. But I recently added another step in between these two, and that's to take my list of important information and ask if there's any way I can split one row into two. So for example, let's say I have a line on my spreadsheet that says, John was in the bell tower during the crime. This is something our sleuth must know in order to solve the case, but we might easily split this information into two pieces like this. Someone was in the bell tower. John was the person in the bell tower. Uh, to do this, we might leave a physical clue in the bell tower, say a little stack of used matchsticks. And when we later see John lighting a cigarette with that same kind of match, we'll have enough info to put two and two together and deduce that John was in the bell tower. Now, what have we accomplished by splitting our clue in two? Well, for starters, we've doubled the number of scenes in which our sleuth is going to be finding clues and making progress towards solving the case. But that that is just the bonus. The real reason I think this tactic is worth pursuing is because it creates that chain of setup and payoff. The setup happens when the reader's curiosity is aroused, when they see those matchsticks in the bell tower and they say to themselves, hmm, I wonder who was there. And the payoff happens when that curiosity is fulfilled, when the reader says to themselves, aha, it was John. A steady stream of hmms and ahas helps to pull your reader along through your manuscript. It gives them things to wonder, things to theorize about, more reasons to keep turning the page than just the hope of all being revealed at the end. They know they're going to get some satisfying little reveals all along the way. And when they get to that aha moment, uh, they might have a couple of different reactions. They might experience validation. They might say, see, I knew it was John. Or they might experience surprise. Uh, John? Really? Either of these is a terrific experience for mystery readers. We like that clever feeling we get when our suspicions are validated, but we also like being wowed with a big surprise. Uh, what can be particularly delicious is to get both experiences at once, as when the reader says something like, I was sure it was John, but I never would have guessed that he'd been blackmailed and forced to be there. If you're enjoying this video so far, please give me a thumbs up. That would help me grow my channel and that's something that would mean a lot to me. And then let's talk about a few more ways that you can use this tactic. Okay, there are actually lots of ways that you can break a clue in two. The one we just discussed, withholding the identity of some character whose actions we have observed, this is probably the most common and the simplest to execute. All you have to do is make sure that your sleuth gets limited information when she first observes the effects of the character's actions. So let's say, for example, that you've written a scene where your sleuth drove by the pond and noticed the Baron's car parked beside it. All you need to do to break that clue in two is just to ratchet down the info that your sleuth gets. Instead of seeing the Baron's car, she's going to see tire tracks. Now she's got a nice clue that ties someone to the pond, but she doesn't know who or why. The remaining information can come all at once later, or you can parcel it out into multiple payoffs. Maybe a local fisherman will find the murder weapon and will learn that the person at the pond was disposing of it. Then near the end, we'll finally learn that it was the Baron all along. Another very easy way to stretch your clue out into a delicious setup and payoff is to make the clue obviously important, but unclear. One of my favorite examples is from the movie Brick, in which our sleuth gets a call from his frightened ex-girlfriend, Emily. He doesn't understand what she's talking about, but all of the phrases she utters in this conversation will be important. I did what she said with the brick. I, I didn't know it was bad, but there's the pins on it now for poor Frisco, and they're playing it all on me. This clue, given in the first five minutes of the movie, will be stretched out into a series of payoffs throughout the course of the film as we learn 
everything that's happened to Emily. Now, there are plenty of ways to use this tactic of making a clue important but unclear. You might have your sleuth overhear a conversation between two characters and they allude to past events that have a personal meaning only to them. Uh, maybe you'll have a character use the jargon of her profession and only when the sleuth learns more about the character's job will he realize what she's referring to. Or you might have a killer leave a cryptic message at the scene of the crime, which will require some interpretation. Another way to stretch out a clue into setup and payoff is to encipher it, that is, put it into code. Uh, let's say our victim is secretly a loan shark who is putting other characters in a financial pinch. Well, we find his ledger revealing the people who are in debt to him, but those people are referred to only by code names. Uh, another possibility could be that your sleuth finds a map and the directions on it simply don't make sense until she cracks the code. Or maybe your villain has just put all the pertinent information in a big ol' cryptex. And still another way to break a clue into is simply to, uh, to break it. Uh, if you let your sleuth get their hands on a clue that has been partially destroyed, like say a photographic negative that's been partially exposed, a blackmail note that's been partially burned, or a painting that's been partially painted over, well, your reader may have a lovely time trying to puzzle out the missing content and waiting for your sleuth to pay it off in the big reveal. Let's look at some clues from the movie Red Dragon and see how they created a delicious series of setups and payoffs for the audience to enjoy. In this movie, FBI agent Will Graham learns that Francis Dollarhide, the killer who he's hunting, has been secretly corresponding with imprisoned serial killer Hannibal Lecter. Lecter has destroyed the part of Dollar Hyde's notes containing instructions for responding, and so now we have a partially destroyed clue, and that is our first setup. Will is able to deduce that the missing part of the letter contains instructions for how Lecter can respond to Dollar Hyde. He's been told to leave a coded message in the personal ads of a tabloid called the Tattler. So this is the payoff for our original clue, but it's also the setup for the next one, Lecter's enciphered response. Will will have to decode that message in order to get us to the next payoff and to find out what the killer's next move is. When you first start thinking about your mystery novel in terms of setups and payoffs, well, it can be a little intimidating. It can feel like suddenly you have twice as much work to do in planning, but I, I don't want you to feel that way, okay? When in doubt, just fall back on this very simple principle. Give information to your reader a drop at a time. Next week, I've got a really fun video for you guys all about three specific twists that you can use in your own mystery novel. I'm I'm really excited about this one. It's been brewing in my head for a while and I don't want you to miss it. So this might be a great time to think about hitting subscribe. Check out.